This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello and welcome to You're Dead to Me, the Radio 4 comedy podcast that takes history seriously. My name is Greg Jenner, I'm a public historian, author and broadcaster and I'm the ex-chief nerd on the BBC comedy show Horrible Histories. And today we are living that city slicker life as we travel back over 500 years to learn about life in Ottoman Istanbul. And to help me find my way around town, I'm joined by two very special guests. In History Corner, she's a professor in Ottoman and Turkish history at Middle East Technical University in Turkey, with expertise in diplomatic and social history. She's written a ton of academic publications, including co-authoring the book A Social History of Istanbul. It's Professor Ebru Boyash. Welcome, Ebru. Thank you for having me on the programme. Delighted. And in Comedy Corner, she's a TV and radio broadcaster, writer, actor and comedian. You'll know her from literally everything on the telly, including Great British Bake Off, insert name here, QI, various documentaries on art, literature, travel and history. Plus, she's the host of the iconic Radio 4 comedy show, Just a Minute. It's the splendid Sue Perkins. We are super delighted to have you here. Yes, that's the level of pun you're getting on this show. OK, I'm just recalibrating. Changing the pun threshold to zero. <laughs> you are famously brainy and, and you've presented historical documentary. So I am uh, automatically, I'm charting you up as a history nerd. Is that fair? I'm history curious. Okay. <laughs> Unlike you guys, I've never put the full force of my, my mental rigour towards history. It's not tended in that direction. You've made a lot of travel documentaries. So can I presume you've been to Istanbul? I haven't actually. It was one of the places that we were slated to go ah. and we were then stopped because it was deemed to be not entirely safe for blithering tourists ah. like myself at, at the time. Well, I've never been either, so we're going to go on a wonderful journey with an expert professor uh, who's going to take us back in time. So, what do you know? Time now for the So What Do You Know? This is where I have a go at guessing what you, our lovely listener, might know about today's subject. And despite the Ottoman Empire having been mega powerful at its height, I think the influence hasn't really translated into pop culture visibility, in the UK at least. If you're a war buff, you might know your Crimean War or even your doomed Gallipoli campaign. But if I say Ottoman, you might be thinking, uh, furniture? But perhaps I'm being unfair. You might be one of the 200 million people to have watched the terrific TV drama Magnificent Century. It's a Turkish show which focuses on Suleiman the Magnificent, the longest reigning of the Ottoman sultans. And if gaming's your thing, you may have wandered the streets of Ottoman Istanbul in Assassin's Creed Revelations. But from law codes and leisure to caravans and coffee houses, what else do we need to know about life in the golden age of Ottoman Istanbul? Right, Professor Ebru, we're doing mid-1400s to mid-1600s, the golden age. We could have just kept going into the 20th century, couldn't we, with the Ottomans? Yes, absolutely, we could. The Ottomans who conquered Constantinople in 1453, in fact, ruled over the empire for them 600 years until it collapsed after the First World War. At its height, Ottoman Empire covered an enormous area stretching in the west from Hungary to Ukraine in the north, across all of what is known as the Middle East and along the North Africa coast up to the borders of Morocco. To cover all this in one podcast will be rather difficult. So we will just <laughs> be looking today at daily life in the empire's capital, magnificent Istanbul. And we start our story in 1453. This is a very famous year in history, and it begins really with the, the fall of the mighty walls of Constantinople. The booming cannons of the Ottoman Turks demolish those walls pretty quick, and this 1,000-year empire falls very fast. And do you know what the empire was that crumbled that day? You know what, the, the pre-Ottoman empire? I don't know which it was. Would it have been the Austro-Hungarian one? No, that's too early. It's a good guess, but no, it's the, uh, we're saying bye-bye Byzantium. Oh, Byzantium, of course. <laughs> the Byzantines, what did they do wrong? <laughs> the wrong place, wrong time. And no cannonballs by the sounds of well, it. Well, they certainly didn't have cannonball-proof walls, sadly. The city had been founded in 330 by Constantine the Great. So this is the Eastern Roman Empire, Sue. So the, the Roman Empire is split in half and the East continues for a, a, over 1,100 years. It's the power base of the Greek Orthodox Church. 
and Constantinople is this mighty city. And then in 1453, suddenly it falls, which is this incredibly serious, huge trauma. And it must have been very, very traumatic for the people in the city, Ebru. Yes, the capture of the uh, city by Mehmed II, known as the Conqueror, on 29th May 1453, was without doubt seen by many contemporaries as cataclysmic event. For the Byzantines, it was the end of their world as they knew it. And for those from the West, it represented a terrifying Ottoman success which threatened their own states. Various contemporary accounts refer to the rivers of blood that flowed through the city with corpses floating out to sea like melons along a canal. Oh, this has got quite dark quite quickly. Yeah. Did the Byzantines get a slight whiff that, that, that an invasion was coming? Of course. The city was sieged many ah. times before by Arabs, by the Ottomans. But the final blow came in 1453 by Mehmed II, who was a very young sultan. And yes, he is known as the conqueror, Mehmed II. And one of the effects, actually, Sue, of the fall of this mighty city is you get refugees, and many of those refugees were very learned. You get scholars and priests, physicians, engineers, poets, and they flee into Europe. A lot of them go to Italy, and actually it helps to push the Renaissance along. But let's get back to Mehmed II. He is the conqueror. He's a young man. He has this huge success. What do you think he does now he's conquered this city? Oh, well, I can only speak personally. The first thing you do is erect an enormous statue of yourself. I mean, just an enormous face <laughs> looking out to sea, preferably in gold. You get the entire workforce who are disgruntled, sad, shell-shocked, if they aren't floating down the river with faces like melons. You get them embarking on public works to reflect your glory and your magnificence. <laughs> or a mini break to Mallorca. It's one or the other. I couldn't quite work out. <laughs> He rebuilds the city, so he's knocked it down. Oh, that's decent of him. But he's going to put it back up. He did not entirely knock it down, Greg. He kept, for instance, uh, St. Sophia, you know, Hagia Sophia. He turned into the mosque. But okay. the thing is, he wanted to restore the city to its former glory because the Byzantine capital, Constantinople, was very declined city because we are talking about a very much a crumbling empire. He wanted to establish it as an economic powerhouse. He therefore began to rebuild the city, constructing markets, not his statue, public baths, mosques, soup kitchens, <laughs> hospitals, schools and aqueducts. Yeah. Oh, so he's going for hearts and minds, basically, isn't he? Yes. He's sorry about the wall. Here's a hospital. Exactly that. Yes, yes. Here's some soup. He is now rebuilding and also, I think we need to just address the name as well, because it's Constantinople when it's part of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. But, Ebru, you've asked us to refer to the city as Istanbul, which is the current name, of course. So is that a name that is in use at the same time? How does the naming change work? Well, the thing is, Istanbul under the Ottomans had many names. Istanbul, Islambul, Dersadet, Asitane, Paidat. But majority of the people use Istanbul during the Ottoman times. Can I just say that I think EasyJet still fly to all of those destinations. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to South End. But yeah. I'm just wondering if he also, amongst his, his many good works and public good deeds, invested in the playgrounds because then he could be the Sultan of Swing. Hey! <laughs> it's very weak, but you did set the pun bar low. <laughs> Actually, they don't do public grants, but Janissaries, this fearsome Ottoman soldiers, actually enjoyed uh, swings very much in the oh. festivals. They hang on big swings all around the city. No one expected <laughs> this. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is, it is one of the major Ottoman entertainment. That was a fun time. But not the Sultan himself, of course. But in the 16th century, you can even find a lot of little uh, illustrations. That was amazing. So the, the city is being rebuilt. He's building soup kitchens and hospitals. He converts the famous church of Hagia Sophia into a mosque. So there is an Islamicization of the city. But also he has to repopulate the city. There's a lot of people have fled, refugees and people died. So who is repopulating the city? 
Not only that, before the war, a lot of people abandoned Constantinople. Mehmet brought people in from different parts of the empire in order to revitalize the city. At the same time, Western merchants, for example, Genovese, continued to live and work there, as of course did part of the original Byzantine population. Mehmet appointed an Orthodox patriarch to be head of the Ottoman Orthodox community. There was also a Jewish community there, uh, which expanded with the arrival of Jews fleeing from Spain after their expulsion in 1492. If you keep in mind the geographical location of the city, it is easy uh, to understand why it was such a magnet for international trade, which also therefore brought in many foreigners to the city. Istanbul became therefore a huge cosmopolitan and multi-religious capital. Even though his his idea was to Islamify the the city, actually it's, as you say, a multi-faith environment where religious faiths are accepted and tolerated. Yes, but that is part of the Ottoman governance practice because they accept the people of book as long as they pay tax. Right. So then they are under protection. Mehmed II, he's investing in hospitals and mosques and all sorts of things. So he's got a huge logistical bottleneck to get through. How do you think he manages all that paperwork, Sue? He could do what I do, just just move it to one side. <laughs> but I suspect the level of paperwork at, at Sultan <laughs> level is probably more than you could. Yeah, I mean, that's difficult. He's either going to abolish it or he's going to have an, a, a bureaucratic class. He's going to invent accountants or something. There's going to be bean counters galore <laughs> that come from all around the world. <laughs> and there are opportunities. <laughs> In Istanbul. Of course, they all speak like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this fantastic sort of civil service. He certainly has all these advisors and bureaucrats. Are they in the palace with him or are they in a sort of boring council estate on the ring road? I'm going to say probably in the palace. What do you reckon? Yes, you are correct. <laughs> Actually, he ruled from the very imposing palace of Klopkapı. He built after the conquest of the city. Bear in mind that these people did not live there, but they worked there or visited the sultan there. So the chief figure of the government uh, after the sultan was the grand vizier. Uh, The grand vizier presided over the imperial council, the divan, which functioned a bit like the cabinet. Other officials or viziers who were in the divan uh, were the defterdar, the official in charge of finances, the chancellor, who was in charge of all official documents and correspondence, so he was the busy person, and the top legal judges responsible for judicial affairs, the Kazaskars. Okay, so you've got a grand vizier, we've got viziers. Yeah, there's so many viziers in there, and so it's a full palace, presumably enjoying lots of work drinks and social occasions <laughs> because they will work together. Um... No, I don't think so. I think they will leave and go to their little uh, abodes outside. So they, they did actually live on the ring road. We've been slightly overcome. They did live on the ring road, but yes. they commuted <laughs> in to a bright gold palace. Was it a gold palace? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Actually, Topkapı is a very humble palace, considering the 19th century Ottoman palaces. But Topkapı is imposing, but not incredibly glorious. It's not. Understood. Okay. I love the idea of a humble palace. This is my humble palace. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just a two up, two down. Have we checked for a basement conversion? <laughs> There's a vast story cubicle building. It's a bungalow. He's got a sultanic bungalow. <laughs> <laughs> what it makes it imposing, it is where it stood. So it's the location is beautiful. Fabulous. Ebru, I'm assuming all these bureaucrats, they're all men, am I assuming? So the question I want to ask is, can women exert political control or influence? Yes, all all these officials were men. I mean, we are talking about early modern uh, period, especially in the Ottoman Empire. But that did not mean that women would not wield political power. The Valide Sultan, for example, the mother of the ruling Sultan, could be a very powerful and influential figure. Indeed, in the first half of the 17th century, Power was effectively in the hands of Mahpeyker Kösem Sultan, uh, the mother of two Ottoman sultans, Murat IV and Ibrahim. This period became known as the Sultanate of Women. The Sultanate of Women. So the Queen Mother, the Sultan's mother, is. It, how do you pronounce that again? Walid Sultan, is that right? Walid Sultan. Sultan, okay. That's the, the Sultan mother. And she would rule over the harem, which is how we pronounce it in English. So... What do you think of when you hear the word harem? I think of a group of beautiful, sexually available women who I, and I would be an outcast, I would not be able to join their ranks. I would be an anomalous member of the harem. (laughs) 
just slightly side eyeing everybody, like um, a, a confused aging Staffordshire Bull Terrier. I would not be welcome <laughs> think, into the into the army of the delicious. They're all kind of full of mysticism and uh, fecundity, and just available, just available, beautiful women that I would find very intimidating. Ebru, that's certainly how I think they're glamorized in in popular culture. Is is the word harem correctly pronounced? It is harem. Uh, harem simply meant uh, the secluded or private part of a house or the female quarters. In the context of the palace, the harem referred to the place where the female members of the royal family, the wives and concubines of the sultan as uh, as their children as well as enslaved females who served them lived. The harem of the ruling sultan was located within the palace of Topkapı. Any son of the sultan was legitimate heir, uh, whether his mother was a wife or a concubine. For the mother of a son, placing her son on the throne had considerable significance, as this would make her the valide sultan, uh, which, as we have seen, was a position that could bring great power. Okay, well, I have lots of questions. <laughs> How many concubines would a sultan normally have? Uh, it depends. No fixed number. There's no limit, for example. No, no, there is no limit. Uh, <laughs> if you want to marry them, there are four wives, but for concubines, no limit. Yeah. Four wives is the limit. Okay, so the concubine mothers push their sons forward, and any one of the boys could end up as the next sultan. Yeah. Which means it's not primogeniture like our system. So it's not the eldest boy who becomes the next sultan. It's whoever gets in the throne first. It's sharp elbows. It's pushy stage mums. Pretty extraordinary. I don't know if we should bring that back in with our royal family. <laughs> I like that. So what would be the ideal qualities they'd look for? The most handsome child, the smartest kid, the, the one that's the, the most aggressive or what would they go for? <laughs> the fastest child, because the fastest child who could reach the throne after the death of the father. So it's entirely based on, on on who could run the fastest 100 metres? No, it's not because uh, Ottoman, Ottoman princes were, uh, after a certain age, they were sent to certain provinces uh, in Anatolia. So the, generally, the, the, the father this, had a favourite, for instance, and he sent it the nearest province as a governor, as a prince. So, of course, once he died, he would be the fastest. It's Hunger Games, isn't it? It's like a TV show. I love that. It's like, yeah, ra race to the throne. <laughs> what happens to the other ones? Is it curtains? Oh, yeah. Okay. We didn't talk about that. There is a, uh, in Ottoman, there is a practice of fratricide. Okay. Yeah. That answers the question. Yes. He will order the uh, execution of his brothers and his brother's sons. Wow. Oh, oh it's gone dark again. OK, let's move away from politics and power, because we want to get to the social history. What jobs could people do in a city like Istanbul? People were employed in one of the trades, uh, industries and crafts that were practiced in the city, uh, many of them belonging to the various artisan guilds of tradesmen, such as shoemakers, tanners, porters and butchers. The hammam, uh, the bathhouse, uh, was a major source of employment, uh, employing attendants, porters and stokers to keep the fires ablaze to heat the water. The dockyards uh, also employed many people, carpenters, shipwrights, laborers, as well as sailors. And this is also a city where enslavement is also part of the economy. I have to honk my problematic slavery uh, klaxon, which I often have to do on this show. There is a slave class, but the slavery is also quite confusing in this city because there are different ways of thinking of it. Yes, uh, military conquests brought with it many enslaved people who were sold in the markets where buyers inspected them physically before purchase. At the same time, slavery in the Ottoman Empire was a little different from slavery elsewhere, for what was important was not free status so much as closeness to the center of power. So the ruling elite were the sultan's slaves. The Grand Vizier, the second most powerful figure in the empire, was therefore a slave. Wow. Were these slaves taken, they took them from presumably North Africa and then moved them into the labor market in the emerging sort of new uh, Istanbul? The majority of the slaves in Ottoman Empire were not black slaves from Africa. Actually, uh, they were prisoners of war, for instance, with Venetians. And also there were certain attacks to Poland or in Caucasus, Ukraine. So they were, uh, you know, captured people. The majority of the slaves were used either in the Navy 
or uh, they were used as like small industries or as household slaves. The prisoners of war, basically, that then sort of repurposed. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's a huge empire, so it, it reaches out uh, into faraway lands. It's fascinating that the Grand Vizier would have been considered enslaved. That's like our prime minister being enslaved, which is a sort of extraordinary idea. But let's move on to city life in terms of um, domestic architecture, in terms of the streets. I mean, Sue, if we dropped you back into Istanbul 500 years ago, what do you think the sort of streets look like, the houses? What do you imagine the local communities felt like? I'm imagining uh, narrow streets, a sort of um, a sort of labyrinthine sort of ad hoc system, buildings the same colour as the earth. I'm imagining that it was incredibly bustling. I'm imagining that there's a lot of market stores and activities, spices, of course, lots of great smells, food. Mm. Then I guess animals are being sold in markets as well, so you've got the constant noise of that. But I'm imagining it as very, a very active, dynamic city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ebru, the word I'm going to mispronounce, Mahale, is that right? Mahale, yes. Do you want to talk us through these and the houses? One of the most important divisions of the city was the Mahale, uh, the neighbourhood or quarter where people lived close together in narrow streets. Here a sort of neighbourhood watch was in operation with every day, uh, everybody watching their neighbours, checking to make sure that they were behaving properly and that no inappropriate behaviour was going on. Houses were wooden and had large lattice windows uh, from which women could watch and listen. A traditional Ottoman house was divided into two parts, uh, the public area, the selamlık, where men received guests, and the harem, the private quarters where women of the uh, house lived. So you've got a kind of neighbourhood watch scheme. Net curtains twitching before their net curtains. It's <laughs> yes, kind of, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just openly staring through open spaces, I guess. Yes, it's not so much Constantinople as Constantinople, no people, I think is probably the, the joke there. But, it's, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you've got, you've got people in tight, snug little communities and maybe they are eavesdropping on each other's lives. But also we've got door-to-door salespeople. We've got vendors bringing sweets and meats and vegetables. But also, Sue, door-to-door poem salesmen and door-to-door matchmaking services. People would come to your door and set you up on a date. I find that less uncomfortable than the poetry. I mean, <laughs> just having to open the door and go, hi, I've, I've got a quatrain I want to run by you. And then just... Like just thinking, I've just got to just breathe very deeply through this. Uh, and I love poetry, but but not all the time and from a select, select providers. OK. I mean, the most iconic street scene in modern Istanbul would be the Grand Bazaar, this enormous, vast covered market with something like 4,000 shops uh, inside. And I'm presuming that also existed back in our, our golden age, back in the 1500s, 1600s, Ebru. So what could you buy at the, at the market in this bazaar? Could, could you just buy everything? So because Istanbul was very much a city of consumption, places like the Grand Bazaar sold goods from all over the world. Luxury goods like silks and satins, uh, spices and precious stones. At the other end of the scale were the markets selling basic foodstuffs, bakers selling bread, or the peddlers going from house to house. Wow, it's a one-stop shop. It's eBay, isn't it? It's 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 it's, 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 <laughs> it's the marketplace where everything's available all the time at the click of a button. We think yeah. Amazon's quick, but you can you can have a, a poem delivered to your door, a suitor delivered to your door. You've got precious stones <laughs> down the road. You've got everything you need. I like the idea of Istanbul. It's great, isn't it? You can shop local and at the same time shop global. It's the perfect combination. Yeah. We also need to talk about clothing, fashion, what people are wearing, because they're not all running around naked, hopefully. This is obviously a, a world where silks are coming in. I mean, is it Bursa that's renowned for its silk? Yes, is that right, it is. Uh, yeah. What kind of variety of clothing do we have in the city? And is there a, are there rules about who gets to wear what kind of clothing? Sartorial <laughs> laws. That, that, that is the point. Everything is available. Even you have money, you can't buy it. So because what <laughs> you could wear was controlled by the sartorial laws. Clothes were markers of social and religious status. So only high up officials, for instance, could wear furs. Certain colors were reserved for a particular religion. Selim the Third, a sultan ruled at the end of the 18th century, for example, ordered that the Orthodox were to dress in black hats and shoes and the Jews in blue ones, while Muslims were to dress in yellow turbans and shoes. In 1580, Christians and Jews were banned from wearing turbans and had to wear hats. They complained because they said 
uh, these new hats made them more susceptible to headaches and colds. <laughs> so you've got your the colour you wear demarcates your religion. Uh, only the wealthiest and most powerful can wear furs. And then hats are, are specific too. So turbans are only for Muslims after 1580. Sue, if you were a benign tyrant, uh, what sartorial rules would you bring in for today? Well, I think everyone should be in pedal pushers because I was forced into a pair of those at a very critical <laughs> age in my early adolescent development at 12. <laughs> and then lots of pictures were taken of that, which I can never unsee and brought out routinely at family gatherings. So if I'm going to suffer, I do believe everyone should. <laughs> Actually, I think I'd probably get, I'd do the opposite of what the Sultan did. I would, I would get everybody in the same sort of clothing. Because oh. clothing for me is, it, you're, you're so right, it demarks certain social status, who's got money, who hasn't, who's in quotes cool, who isn't, who's in the club, who's in the gang and who isn't. So I'd probably have just said everyone wears the same thing um, rather than going uh, to the opposite degree that he has by saying we're going to colour code people according to their, <laughs> to their religious beliefs, which for me, the moment you start doing that and making things easily identifiable, you're on the approach road to being able to contain and then eliminate so that makes me very queasy as to what happens to these different ethnic and religious groups now that they're being classified mm. Ebru? i agree i mean uh, i wouldn't want to live in that world but the point is that the aim was to ease the governance it's a way of controlling and ordering the city but also apart from making the different religious groups to dress uh, differently Idea also make sure that people should not spend more than they could afford, or they shouldn't uh, dress above their status. For instance, you could be very rich, but you were not able to dress like a grand vizier. So the money did not give the right to you to dress as you like. So you couldn't be showy. No, you couldn't. But they did it. Of course, that's another thing. This this sartorial laws were always renewed. For instance, in 1580, the hats were introduced. They complained, changed. Now they could wear turbans. So in a way, there was always a negotiation. The laws were ignored. So that is the Ottoman system. They imposed something and they reimposed it because it wasn't possible to implement it. Okay, let's move on to food because, I mean, Sue, you're a big foodie. You famously presented several food programs and the, the Ottoman world is full of a variety of foods, Ebru. So what, what would be on the menu? There was a huge diversity of uh, types of food. So spices from the Far East, rice from Anatolia, cheese from the Aegean Islands and from the Balkans, grain from Egypt, meat from the Balkans, butter from Crimea, Olive oil from the Asian region, chestnuts from Bursa. Typical foods included bread, pilaf, rice, and kebab. Uh, more luxuries, so something not eaten every day was clotted cream. Mm. Uh, there were places uh, in the city as early as the 16th century where women went to eat clotted cream, a bit like eating fancy ice cream. The sultans could not afford to have a hungry population who might then, of course, revolt. So there was a complex system of provisioning the city. Wowzers. Clotted cream sounds nice, Sue. Oh, just that women would, would meet and eat clotted cream. <laughs> I can get done with that. Without, without guilt, without a Cosmopolitan article telling you that you know, you're only three weeks away from a bikini body. Who cares? It sounds. It does sound amazing, and as you say they've got they've got access to the, to all the different flavorings and mm. uh, commodities from that vast sprawling empire. Well, places like the Balkans and Ukraine have traditionally been the sort of breadbasket for for all of us for years. So it's interesting that they were even back then sort of supplying that yeah. particular ingredient. To- Absolutely, and the and the other famous thing, of course, about uh, modern Turkey would be coffee, and it's still the same thing in in the golden age, the fifteen hundreds, sixteen hundreds. Coffee houses everywhere. Not one of them are Starbucks, but the Sultan often tried to ban them. Any guesses why, Sue? Oh well, I imagine it's inflamed appetites. I imagine there was something about the caffeine that created a, a great a great and deep stirring in the minds and hearts of the populace, and they needed to be sort of sedated. So bread will do that. And if that doesn't work, the clotted cream, without question. There's nobody's ever rioted after a plate of clotted cream. It's not going to happen. Yeah, it happens the same in England as well. Charles II mm. also bans coffee houses for a while. It's the notion that there's these 
places become hotbeds of dissent, political rumor and gossip. Yeah, the meeting houses. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's it's where ideas get shared and not good ideas. So the sultans try to banish them, but can't get rid of them. People desperately want them, and so the saying goes: If you can't beat them, Sue, join them, tax them. Uh, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> they set up their own coffee houses. The viziers set up their own coffee houses. They make uh, money off it. Talk about being on the grind, which is a both a drug dealing and coffee double pun. So you're welcome. We've talked about food a lot. But we want to talk also about feasting and grand occasions and and people coming together to celebrate. And one of the biggest occasions for a knees up was to celebrate the circumcision of the Sultan's sons. That's not easy to say. Uh, no, it's not. Or, or, Respect to you for that. Yeah. <laughs> or easy to watch, I imagine. I was going to say, it's not just the saying, it's the sort of thinking about it. That's the thing that makes me wince. Uh, but Ebru, can you tell us about the grand circumcision festival? Celebrations for the uh, circumcisions of royal sons were uh, magnificent affairs in the city. During the 60 day celebrations for the circumcision of Murat it the took Kurt, 60 days. And hopefully, not, not the operation. They need to really sharpen up in, in every sense. <laughs> <laughs> ouch, ouch. And, uh, I think the celebrations took 60 days, not okay. the circumcision. I hope not. <laughs> uh, during the 60 day celebrations for the circumcision of Murat III's eldest son, Mehmet, uh, in uh, 1582, a giant kitchen was set up with 500 cooks who prepared uh, food every day for the poor, hungry and destitute. During such festivities, circumcisions would also be provided for thousands of poor boys. Uh, the purpose uh, of such pageantry was not only to display power, but also to bring uh, in the population, to provide them with festivities, to break the routine of life and to connect people personally to the success of the empire. This need to provide almost a release mechanism to the populace was recognized uh, by one of the officials of the Selim II when he remarked to the Sultan that by nature people cannot bear constant repression, they sometimes want release. Lovely. You can't always push people down. You've got to give them the occasional moment to enjoy themselves, even if it's a mass circumcision. A mass circumcision. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's their equivalent of the Platinum Jubilee. You know, it's just get the street parties going. Who's not been circumcised? Might as well do it now. Get the sausage sandwiches out. Oh, no, not sausages, please. (laughs) I bet you, I bet you, somebody served sausages. Someone's going to have done that. Circumcision presumably was part of the sort of religious, uh, yeah, yeah, practice. And... But would every community, not just the Islamic community, come together for the 60-day circumcision get-together? Yeah, it is open for the city population. And a lot of also, of course, uh, foreigners, non-Ottomans, mm. watched them and they were included. Oh, did they actually watch the circumcisions? Were the circumcisions public? No, no, the circumcisions were done oh, publicly. That's good. I mean, uh, the celebrations <laughs> for 60 days, uh, especially foreign ambassadors were very much welcomed because also it was a great demonstration yeah, absolutely. of power. The Sultan was able to organize such a big celebration. Everybody were enjoying, food was served. I mean, uh, rice and meat, I mean, mm. saffron rice mm. and all these things. And uh, it is very much an occasion one of the things you mentioned, Ebru, was the opening of the kitchens for the poor, the feeding of the poor. And I, I wanted to ask about charity in the city, in the system. Is there a sort of welfare state? We can't talk about welfare state, but there was a welfare system. And there was a system of the Wakaf uh, or Pious Foundation, which was a central institution of Ottoman life throughout all empire. Uh, Wakafs were endowments which owned shops or agricultural land or other, uh, other economic units. The income from which was then used to pay the upkeep of mosques, schools and hospitals. Uh, it also paid for water and food for, uh, for the poor, schooling and feeding for orphans. Some Wakafs were enormous mosque complexes which included schools, hospitals, soup kitchens, baths and caravansarais, uh, guest houses. Some were set up by women like Hiram Sultan, uh, the wife of Suleiman I. One of the most famous imperial wakfs uh, was the Fatih Mosque complex, built by Mehmet II, which fed a thousand people twice a day. Wow. Uh, they served rice soup, wheat soup, and saffron rice. The hospital provided free treatment and food. So this is amazing. So you've got businesses set up where the profits are then put back into looking after the local community, as well as mosque complexes, which are feeding the poor 
a thousand people twice a day. It's really quite something, isn't it? It's, it's almost better than Victorian London. Oh God, absolutely. I mean, it's way better than Victorian London, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they sort of had to bring in school meals because children weren't being fed at home. Mm. You know, it's sort of, it's amazing. There's sort of social enterprise that's going on. Yeah. As a teetotaler myself, I wanted to ask about alcohol because this is an Islamic city in theory. I know it's multi-faith, but this is, you know, the laws are being made by a sultan who's a Muslim. What is the policy on alcohol? Under Islamic law, alcohol consumption was banned for Muslims. This does not uh, apply to non-Muslims who were permitted to drink, to produce and to trade alcohol in Istanbul. But of course, Muslims did drink. Uh, the most popular venues in the 16th century were boza hanes, uh, where boza, an alcoholic drink made from fermented barley or millet, was served and often drunk with kebabs. There were also many wine houses in the city. In the later centuries, rakı, uh, the famous aniseed drink, became very popular. Drinking was ignored uh, by the authorities, but if drinking led to a problem, then it was punished. Okay, so there's a sort of don't ask, don't tell policy if you're sort of moderately drinking. There's drinking culture and there's also, of course, bathing culture, which is so important even in modern Turkey. Um, the hammams, these bathhouses, they're a place of recreation, of sanitation, of hygiene, but also of employment. Who's going to the hammams? The hammam was a fundamental social space and was about much more than washing it was a multi-religious and multi-ethnic social space, segregated according to gender, in, uh, with men and women going at different times or different bathhouses. Okay. Uh, the hammam gave, in particular to women, uh, a place to meet and socialize, exchange gossip, check out potential brides for their sons. It was where they celebrated after the births of their children and where babies were taken for their uh, first evolutions, but the hammam could also have a more dangerous uh, space because it could be a venue for political criticism. Ah, so like the coffee mm. houses, people are going to the baths and they're having a, they're having a gossip. Sue, is that you? Do you? When you go to a sauna, are you... <laughs> when I go to a sauna, well, I'm all, you know me, Greg, I'm, on, I'm always in a sauna. <laughs> I've been to a Turkish bath in, in Budapest and um, mm. I was so shocked and traumatised by what happened there that I don't think <laughs> I necessarily have the mental capacity to think deeply conspiratorial political thoughts because I was <laughs> moving. I, I have a problem with going with the general flow. So they were processing through various different temperatures and I just went the wrong way, which meant I went from the boiling place <laughs> to a man <laughs> pulling a rope and a bucket of ice water falling on me and me screaming and then being thrown again into the boiling place. And so it got very <laughs> out of hand and I found it quite triggering. But anyway, they're points of congregation, aren't they? So as opposed to a religious meeting place, in other meeting spaces that are secular, gossip's king, isn't it? So you can yeah. sit in sort of tepid water and, and have a little chat about, oh, I tell you what, I tell you, it's an absolute ask is, you know, What's his chopped Mehmet? And, um, yeah, but what can they do? They can't <laughs> close them down, can they? I mean, you can't close them down. No. Because it's, as you say, it's important uh, revenue and jobs creation and all the rest of it. And so important in, in the Islamic faith to, to wash. It's part of the, the part of yeah. practice, isn't it? So so crucial. The bathing is so important, Ebru, but of course, every city in history is dirty, dangerous. There are plagues and diseases. Istanbul is not different, is it? There are There are serious outbreaks throughout the various years. Like all the early modern states, Istanbul too had virtually no sanitation and people often lived together in close proximity, allowing uh, for the rapid spread of disease. Devastating plagues were frequent. In the summer of 1467, for example, so many people died that bodies were left unburied because there was oh, wow. not one left to bury them. Uh, many thousands died in the plagues of 1492, 1586 and 1598. Other diseases also struck, like smallpox in 1785, when many royal babies died in the palace. Oh, it's horrible. That's a tale as old as time. All cities have always had horrible outbreaks. So the obvious question, Ebru, is how available is medical treatment? In Istanbul, medical treatment was provided uh, in uh, the hospitals, in the great mosque complexes, where people could stay and be treated for free. One English traveller in the 17th century described the great mosque complex of Mehmet II, which he said contained a place where they give up shrub 
and medicines free of charge to all who ask for them. Uh, this hospital also had a hammam. Attached to it were patients and their clothes were washed. This hospital complex also served as an educational institution, rather like teaching hospitals in Britain today. Medical students worked at the hospital and attended lectures given by the doctors. Uh, there were also doctors, often Jewish, who worked in the palace. More generally, medical care would have been provided by traditional healers. It's amazing, isn't it? And, uh, and Sue, uh, patients had legal rights as well, uh, enshrined in law. They could sue their doctor. Wow, how very American. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> okay, so they go in and receive treatment for free, and then they can weaponize this treatment. As I understand it, the hospital complexes were run more by the religious organizations and charity. Okay. But if you hired a private doctor, you could sue them, which meant that those doctors then in turn would then often start offering their patients no guarantee of success forms before I treat <laughs> you. So there's a sort of litigious culture that develops in the private sector. But there was this public sector, this charity sector that looked after people. And I think what's quite interesting for me, Ebru, is that women were also part of this medical world, which is not surprising, of course, but they could be doctors. They could be surgeons. They, they're they not just nursing or, or doing midwifery. Oh, that's interesting. So they're not in, just in the traditional medical arena, by which I mean sort of the ancients, the kind of the healer woman. They're also mm. in hospitals and enshrined in those jobs. They are not in the hospitals. They are private surgeons. They can perform operations. They're called jeva. The doctor and surgeon are slightly different. So they learned the job like apprentices. You know, mm-hmm. They've learned from the others. They are trained, not educated. Yes, women worked as midwives, true, healers, bone setters, and surgeons. There are some cases showing that women surgeons performed hernia operations on men. Wow. That's cool. You wouldn't want that in 15th, 16th century Constantinople with no anaesthetic, though. Yeah, that's a serious operation. And there's also, we've talked about medical fraud in terms of suing your, suing your doctors, because occasionally I think some doctors were frauds and quacks. So occasionally there was, some, there was always going to be some dodgy bloke who could do you a cure. I can do your kidneys. I can sort, <laughs> I can sort out your piles. No worries. Bend over. Yeah. We should talk also briefly about crime as, as a wider issue within within the city. How does law and order work? Maintaining law and order was uh, an array of major importance in such a large city uh, like Istanbul. Uh, It could be a very violent city and because it was the capital of the empire, it was often the setting for violent revolt. There was a variety of law and order officials operating in the city, including the Janissaries and the Bostan Cebuşi, who was the very powerful head of a unit of armed guards. Courts throughout the city were presided over by the Cuddles, the judges. The legal system in the Ottoman Empire reflected the great diversity of population. Uh, so Christian and Jewish communities also had their own courts for uh, intercommunal affairs. Okay. At the level of the Mahalle, the local districts of the city, law and order was maintained by the religious official known as Imam. Uh, the Kadı, the judge, uh, and in the later century, the Muhtar, the secular headman of the Mahalle. That's so interesting. You've also then got this sort of bigger court system and then almost a local court system in the, with your local imam, your local judge in the Mahalle, in the, in the kind of neighbourhood. Well, I guess we, we have a similar system, don't we? We, we have sort yeah. of, that was like a small claims court and then you can have, <laughs> you, you, you know, go all the way up to the old Bailey and Crown Court and, you know, for different types of, civil or criminal misdemeanors but it's interesting that it breaks along religious lines too which is something that's that often crops up you know in the uk it's you know should we entertain the idea of small-scale islamic courts or indeed small-scale catholic courts or whatever you know i mean it's interesting that Mm. they had that going on that they had they were able to embrace different communities and to allow those communities to have a you know some sense of self-governance I don't know how real that sense was. I mean, I, think, I imagine if they got out of hand, then the prevailing authorities would, would clamp down pretty hard. And the clamping down, actually, in terms of reducing crime, Ebru, uh, there was there are a few different policies. Yes, of course, uh, curfews, uh, collective punishment, exile, imprisonment, very brutal corporal punishment and execution. 
Uh, there were spies in cafe shops, spies, hamams, okay, and barber shops throughout wrongdoing. Sultans would also go out in, go out in disguise through the city. The 17th century Sultan uh, Murat IV, uh, who was very hostile to smoking, which he banned, had the reputation of touring the city at night looking for smokers, who, if caught, were killed. Yeah. Well, they say smoking kills. But wow, that's, it's, that's a lot faster than any of us could have imagined. On the side of the packet, this is dangerous for your health because Murad the Fourth will hunt you down. Yeah, he would go undercover sometimes, or he would go out in the streets. Oh, I mean, can you imagine like an episode of Undercover Boss where the the guy in the bad wig just starts sort of hacking down? I'm his, imagining like, him though, employees. still with a massive sultan's turban, so you're just having a crafty snout at the back, and something a dude with a massive gold turban is just sort of bearing down on you. <laughs> Let's change tack away from terrifying murder murderous sultans and look instead uh, at dating and romance and courtship to round out our episode. We've heard about door-to-door people <laughs> setting you up on dates with strangers, which is charming or terrifying, depending on your how you feel about strangers asking about your love life. Ebru, how, how does dating work? How would you meet a suitor? How might you flirt? Where might you go for perhaps some fun, sexy times with strangers? Yeah. Uh, dating is not the right word, perhaps, okay. because if they come to your door, if you your parents agree to marry you off, therefore you don't date, you marry. Well, they come to the door and you marry the person at the door. <laughs> no, just the matchmakers come and they just say that those two people are suitable for each other. They negotiate and then you end up getting married. But because the contacts between the sexes were highly controlled and there were very few places where flirting could uh, take place, and of course this flirting is not acceptable way of flirting, but still they did it. For instance, one of the locations was the famous Kyatane or Sadabat, uh, known to the Europeans as Sweet Waters. The Sweet Waters, lovely, uh, okay. Yes, like uh, especially this was very popular in the 19th century. Uh, this was an immensely popular pleasure garden with streams and meadows and forests, which covered an enormous area and where behavior that was not socially acceptable could be got away with and concealed from uh, unwanted eyes. Okay, so the sweet waters is uh, putting the pleasure in pleasure garden, Sue. That's where you go for a, for a cheeky snog. Yeah. Okay. I can see. I can see a lot of adolescents going straight to the sweet waters. Um, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It doesn't matter at what period of time. Uh, human beings will always find a park under cover of night to do what needs to be done. To drink strongbow and get fingered on a bench. That's it. That's- <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're talking about for me all of the 80s, at least half of the 90s. Um, and, you know, always fingers crossed that it could come again. That time could come again, Greg. Never rule it out. <laughs> and there's also ways of flirting in the streets, for example. There's the, the language of flowers, and there's also parasol signals, which sounds, sounds a little bit vague. Is this poetry? How, how do flowers come into it, and how do parasols come into it? The parasols are used, especially in the 19th century. For instance, if the woman swung her parasol rapidly from right to left... This was a warning to the man to pass swiftly by. Okay. <laughs> Swipe left. <laughs> if you close it and it stays closed, this means that they would make an arrangement to meet the following day. So coded language could also use flowers or other day objects like fruit or vegetables. Uh, the code worked on the basis of a rhyme linking the message and the object. Elif, yaprak in Turkish, thus meant either love me or leave me. Yasev, beni ya burak. The rhyme here was rak ya prak burak. Either love me or leave me. So it's a sort of it's a language based on rhyme and poetry, but it's almost Cockney rhyming slang in some ways. So it's it's sort of a chat up, but Apples also and pears, isn't it? Yeah, a little like, literally, bit. Literally, yeah, yeah. Slightly earlier on in history, in British history, they were doing the same sort of signalling with fans, and so it's amazing how people find a way, don't they, of subtly communicating sexual interest, even if it's very frowned upon. Socially, it's cool. And there was also one other person I should mention very quickly. Apologies, Ebru, for pronunciation, but Evliya Chelebi, perhaps? Is that? Evliya Chelebi, yes. Not my worst. He uh, was a travel writer who wrote about the idea of a womanising loot, which is a loot that uh, people are playing in the streets and all the ladies poke their head out the window to enjoy the sound. And and that's how people are picking up chicks. But, I mean, much like the house party where the guy gets the acoustic guitar out, it's time for us all to go. The nuance window! So it's time now for the nuance window. 
This is where Sue and I sit back for two minutes with our clotted cream, I think, and enjoy our <laughs> tasty treats. And we allow our expert, Professor Ebru Boyage, to tell us uh, about something to do with Ottoman Istanbul. She has two uninterrupted minutes. And uh, without much further ado, Professor Ebru, take it away, please. In order to understand Istanbul, we need to move away from the more traditional approach of seeing the Ottoman Empire as something oriental, located away to the east, separated from and never part of the European world. We also need to move away from the tendency to portray the empire in religious terms and to abandon the approach of viewing the Ottoman world through the prism of a Muslim-Christian divide. Istanbul was like any other European city, but bigger, more cosmopolitan, more diverse, and in its heyday, much richer. Its ruling elite was certainly more diverse in origin than the ruling elites of its neighbors to the west. Its grand viziers could be from Bosnia or Albania, its grand admirals from Genoa, the women of the imperial harem from Venice or Ukraine. Its population was more multicultural, more ethnically diverse, and more religiously diverse than many of the cities in Europe. It had a large population of uh, Greek Orthodox, a Jewish population, and a population of Catholics, many of whom were Genoese in origin and who had stayed on after the fall of Constantinople in 1453. There was also a resident population of foreigners, merchants, the diplomatic communities, the sailors and craftsmen employed in the dockyards. It was an opulent international emporium where, in the words of a 16th century Ottoman historian, the buyers and the sellers of the market of the world all came together. The important thing is thus to see Istanbul for what it was, a megalopolis of the early modern world, but not to trap it in the limited and limiting paradigms of the East-West Muslim-Christian divide. Beautiful. You're absolutely right. I think we tend to think of Istanbul as the gateway to the East, but in saying that, it's the we, we do locate it in the East. It's othered, it's different, it's unknowable. There's also the fact that we, we absolutely perceive it as Islamic. What I've learned today, which has been amazing, is like all empires, but particularly more so, I think, is that the huge diversity of people that it encompasses and different types of people could hold power. That's blown my mind. The Grand Vizier could be from Bosnia, maybe, or Albania, or and that's extraordinary because it's something I just hadn't thought about. I certainly hadn't thought about Ukrainians in Istanbul. I hadn't thought about, you know, I thought about Venetians maybe, but yeah, it's really, it's, um, it's really, really interesting. It's made me want to go even more now, and I'm very frustrated <laughs> that I'm not, I'm not there. But um, I feel very privileged to have had that drive-by, and in two minutes too, that was that was a tour de force. Yes, thank you, Ebru. So what do you know now? Okay, well, it's time now for our quick fire quiz. This is the So What Do You Know Now? This is where we take our comedian Sue and uh, and see how much has gone in uh, into that famous brain of yours. And you are holding your face in dread. <laughs> oh, it's like being at school again. I mean, you're used to hosting panel shows. So I suppose this is the, the shoes on the other foot now. You're, uh, we've turned the table. I hide my stupidity by asking other people questions. Yes. We've got 10 questions. So here we go. So question one. In what year did the Ottomans conquer Constantinople? 1453. It was. Question two. Who was the first Ottoman sultan who, after plundering the city, went on not to build a statue, but to rebuild and repopulate it? Mehmet. It was Mehmet II. Question three. Do you remember who was the Walid sultan? Well, she was the mum. She was, yeah, the queen mother. She was the, the queen sultan mum. mum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Question four. What was the name of the neighbourhood or small little community where families would live in close proximity? It begins with M. Mahale. It was Mahali, beautifully pronounced, I think. Question five. What coded language would you use if you wanted to flirt with someone? The language of flowers. It was. Question six. Pageantry played a huge part in the running of the city. In 1582, there was a 60-day festival celebrating <laughs> what? <laughs> Circumcision. Circumcision of, uh, yeah, the, the, the son of the sultan. It was. Question seven. What are Ottoman bathhouses called? Hamams. Ah, question eight. The Sarabad, or Sweet Waters, which is the European name for it, was a sort of place where you might go for some romantic action. What was it? It was Sweet Waters. It was a park. It was a huge pleasure garden. Yeah. Question nine. Uh, Name one of the operations that women surgeons could perform on male patients. 
A hernia operation. It was, and this for a perfect score. Question 10. Sartorial laws governed who could wear certain things. What headwear was prohibited for Jews and Christians in 1580? And they complained about getting colds. Turbans. It was turbans. A perfect score. 10 out of 10. See, you are clever. (laughs) You've made me clever, the pair of you. (laughs) That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sue. And listener, if you want to hear more about City Slicker life, then why not listen to our episode on the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s? Or if you're champing at the bit for more Turkish history, but slightly more ancient, then uh, why not check out our episode on Chattel Hoyuk and the Neolithic Revolution? That's the Stone Age to you and me. You'll find them all on BBC Sounds along with our back catalogue. And remember, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review, share the show with your friends, make sure to subscribe to your Dead to Me on BBC Sounds so you never miss an episode. But I'd love to say a huge thank you to our wonderful guests in History Corner. We had the illustrious Professor Ebru Boyash from the Middle East Technical University in Turkey. Thank you, Ebru. Thank you, Greg and Sue, for this lovely time. Fantastic. And in Comedy Corner, we've had the sublime Sultan herself, Sue Perkins. Thank you, Sue. Honestly, a real pleasure. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. And to you, lovely listener, join me next time as we rummage through the bazaars of history with two different shopping companions. But for now, I'm off to go and spread rumours in the local hammam. Bye! Your Dead to Me was a production by The Athletic for BBC Radio 4. The research was by Claudia Treacher and Genevieve Johnson-Smith. The episode was written by Emma Nagoose, Claudia Treacher and me. It was produced by Emma Nagoose and me and assisted by Emmy Rose Price Goodfellow. The project managers were Cypher Mio and Isla Matthews and the audio producer was Abby Patterson. I find quantum mechanics confusing today. You've been listening to a Radio 4 podcast. It was probably in our time. But this is a trail for something. It could have been Gardner's Question Time or The Archers. This is a trail for something else. This is a trail for the Infinite Monkey Cage. And we're back. Also, if you've been listening to any questions or any answers as well, you're also allowed in. The Infinite Monkey Cage, we're back with a new series. We've got Eric Idle, Tim Minch and Alan Davis. We've got uh, Brendan Hunt. We've got Sarah Pascoe, Katie Brown, Dave Gorman, Chris Hadfield, Nick Ostott, Carolyn Porco, Diva Amon, Hannah Fry, David Spiegelhalter, Uta Frith, Suzanne Simar, Jan Eleven, Netta Engelhart. So many things. And we're going to cover bats versus flies, the wood wide web, black holes, deep oceans, earth from space, how to teach maths and how brains communicate. And you can listen on BBC Sounds, but I suppose you know that because you're listening to this on BBC Sounds because it's a podcast trail. Hmm. It's a good point. We should probably cut that last bit. I bet they don't, though. No, it's a contractual obligation. In the infinite monkey cage. Turn that nice again. <laughs>